Hello and welcome to The Sweaty Startup. Today we're going to talk about overcoming anxiety and the fear of failure when it comes to entrepreneurship. We all know that feeling, that feeling of inadequacy, that feeling of rejection, the feeling of embarrassment, the feeling of anxiety that comes along with entrepreneurship and generally anything that's worth doing in this life. So I'll start out with a story, and this is a story that I remember as one of my biggest failures. Seems pretty trivial now looking back, but I'll try to set the stage and tell you a story about this. So it was a, a basketball game, a high school basketball game in southern Indiana, and basketball is intense in southern Indiana. I was a sophomore, I was a role player on the varsity team. I think I may have been our second leading scorer, but it was only 8 or 10 points a game because we had a very good star player on our team who ended up getting a division one scholarship to go play basketball and our job as underclassmen I was a sophomore we passed the ball and made it easier for our star player to do what he does best he averaged over 25 points per game and because he was on our team and just because of the general culture in Indiana these high school basketball games were extremely popular on a Friday Saturday night People just went to local basketball games. It's what they did for fun. It was common for two or 3,000 people to pack these you know, fairly large high school gymnasiums, and the atmospheres were electric. Picture the movie Hoosiers and the Duke basketball atmosphere that you have going on. Um, you know, A smaller version of that, obviously. And this particular day that I remember so vividly, it was the biggest game of the year for our team. It was against our rivals on the other side of the county. And it was on their court, so we were away from home, and the atmosphere was extra crazy. There were full student sections, hundreds of kids standing up. They had their faces and their chests painted. They had their shirts off. They had signs made up. And they stood up, and they chanted, and they cheered the entire game. So first half going just fine. Um, there weren't a lot of guys on our team, so I played I played basically the whole game. First half, our star player, right before halftime, gets his third foul and has to come out of the game. And the game was very intense, intense at this time. And it was the first time that, in a high-pressure situation, he had, he had left the game all season. So all of us young kids were kind of looking at each other like deer in headlight, headlights, wondering you know, how we were going to do this without our main guy. And... I think we were winning the game by a few points when this happened. Well, one trip down the court, we pass the ball around. I get the ball in the corner, shoot a three-pointer, and sure enough, air ball. And when you air ball in Southern Indiana basketball in front of a crowd like this, you don't hear the end of it. So we hear the chance, air ball, air ball, air ball. Well, I start to get a little nervous. The other team comes down and drills a three-point basket. And the crowd goes ballistic. Next time down, ball gets passed around a few times, ends up in my hands again. I drive to the middle, leave my feet for a shot, and I realize as soon as I take, take off, as soon as I jump, that this shot's going to get blocked. So I change my mind, try to pass it to one of my teammates. It's a bad pass. The ball gets picked off. The other team takes off the other way, goes down, and dunks it. And dunks aren't that common in high school basketball. So the crowd now really goes nuts. Our coach calls a timeout. We try to regroup. There's about a minute left. We go, we go down the floor the next time and I end up driving to the basket, taking, taking a contested layup that wasn't really that close. The other team turns up the defensive intensity. They're super high pressure. They got a full court press on us. They get a layup. We turn the ball over as a team again, get another layup. Team goes down and scores again. So with just a few seconds before halftime, once again, I get thrown the ball, I drive down the sideline, and I go up for a layup. A defender got great position, they slid over, and they took a charge. It was an offensive foul on me. Another turnover, the clock expires, and it's halftime. So now we're down about 10 points going into the half. And as we walk off the court, the other team is jumping around. Their crowd is cheering like crazy. And our fans begin to stand up and boo. They're booing our team. And then I realized that they're booing me. A few fans in particular stood up and started pointing and yelling at me on the court. So 
we go into the locker room and I sit there in silence. After a minute or two, which seems like an eternity, our coach storms in with a red face and a clipboard, walks right up to where I'm sitting and points at me and screams right in my face in front of all of the guys on our team, probably 12 people in there, another five assistant coaches. He screams in my face, you are not our best player. You will never be our best player. Stop trying to be our best player. Then he slams down the clipboard and walks right out. And that was the extent of our halftime talk. So I will never forget those 10 minutes of my life. That voice is deeply ingrained in my mind. I'll never forget the look in my coach's eye. I'll never forget the feeling of walking off that court. I'll never forget the just pure anxiety that was, that was those last two minutes of that game filled me with. All of this as a 16-year-old, just trying to figure out life and where I fit in. So I, I realized that this is first world problems. I'm, I'm a middle class white male and that experience pales in comparison to what some people deal with, even on a day to day basis. But that's my story and that's, that's ingrained in my mind as a, a failure that led to a lot of anxiety and just made me not want to be there. I just didn't want to be there anymore. So it's ingrained in our mind from a traumatic experience like that as a kid. Maybe a cruel bully. Maybe a parent who just didn't build us up and instead tore us down and criticized us or maybe emotionally abused us every single day. It was maybe an abusive girlfriend or boyfriend. Um, you know, maybe a sports moment. And, and what looking back is just an absolutely insane sporting environment with the pressure that the parents put on the kids and that the fans put on the kids. You know, maybe something like that where failure is so measured and obvious in front of everyone. So either way, you know, it can still plague us to this day, that inadequacy, that voice inside our head that's telling us that we just don't have what it takes to be successful, that we'll never be good enough, that we just don't measure up, that other people can do it, but, you know, other people can win, but I never will win. You know, that was put on all of us. And this isn't just men, it's not just women. This is extremely common for all human beings to experience at one point or another. Every single one of us at times, we have that anxiety that arrives, that self-doubt that arrives when we are in an uncomfortable or unpredictable situation. It's that heightened sense of self-criticism, that voice telling us that we just aren't quite good enough, that, that lizard brain that tells us we should just retreat back to safety. And it's that reluctancy to trust ourselves and instead we trust that one bully or that one coach that told us that we weren't good enough when we were in, in elementary school or in high school or whatever it is, you know, that we just aren't good enough and we can't do this. And that anxiety can really be crippling. So this is incredibly prevalent in our personal relationships. Maybe somebody that we love, somebody that we care about is doing something amazing. And instead of being able to tell somebody that they're doing something amazing, we, we're afraid to tell them because of our own insecurities, our own inadequacies, and in a way, our own jealousy that stems from that. So maybe it's our own insecurities that lead us to trust issues that end up killing most of the relationships before they get serious in our life. Maybe it's the inclination in our lives to conform to what other people are doing. In middle school, we call that peer pressure, right? And you say, oh, well, that goes away when you get older. No, that's wrong. Now it's called keeping up with the Joneses. That's called getting an expensive college degree so that we can afford the car payment on our $60,000 Chevy Tahoe and the payments on our $500,000 house in the swanky part of town and the credit card payments on the bills we rack up while doing all the fine dining with our friends at expensive restaurants. Okay, so maybe it's the fear of rejection that cripples us that keeps us playing the safe game. Maybe it's this fear of rejection that keeps us playing and complying and doing exactly what everyone else is doing. Maybe our number one goal in life is to just make sure those feelings of failure and those feelings of inadequacy never show their faces again. Those feelings that of being the target of booze from a crowd or the screaming coach, just make sure at all costs that that never happens to me again. 
So don't take any risks, don't take any chances, don't do anything uncomfortable, and just make sure that it never happens again. So there's nowhere in life that this is more prevalent than when it comes to your career and entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is just like that basketball game. The stakes are high. Failure is obvious when it happens. It's uncomfortable. It's risky. Your friends are going to make jokes and talk down to you when you buy that $1,500 used cargo van on Craigslist. They sure did that to me as well. So that risk of failure is incredibly scary. Maybe it affects you in the opposite way and forces you to overcompensate. The anxiety forces you to try the long shot venture capital backed company, the one that you, you know probably won't succeed and try to become the next Steve Jobs, to try to become the next Elon Musk, to try to change the world. Maybe you just wanna to prove to everyone so bad that you are indeed spectacular and that they were wrong and that your coach was wrong and that your dad was wrong or whoever was wrong. Maybe you just wanna to prove to everyone that you're indeed the person that can do this stuff. So in either case, there's a fear that you'll lose your status, the fear of failure. There's a fear of what other people will think of you. So how do you manage this fear of insecurity, the fear of failure, the fear of rejection, and how do you suppress those negative emotions so that we can achieve our goals, so that we can start a business, so that we can find happiness in life, so that we can do whatever we wanna do? Well, it starts with answering one simple question. Who am I seeking approval from? Who am I seeking approval from? And I have news for you here is that the only person you need approval from is yourself. You are the person that controls your emotions. You are the person that determines if you're happy or not. You are the leader of your own life. The sooner you stop chasing stamps of approval from other people, you'll be much, much better off and happier because of it. So instead of letting the Joneses set your standards you need to feel good about yourself, it's time to set your own. The standards that you need to feel good about yourself. Set those standards yourself. How do you want to live? What 20% of activities bring you 80% of your joy? What moral code do you want to live by? What makes you happy as a person? And you might say, yeah, what about the other people? What about my husband? What about my wife? What about my best friends? What about my family members, the closest relationships? Yeah, their opinion does matter. Their opinion of you matters. But these people love you and care about you because of who you are. They care about you because of your moral compass. They care about you because of what drives you, because of what makes you happy. So if you approve of yourself and you're happy and confident in your own skin, these people will automatically love you and stick beside you and will be happy for you. You will get their approval as a byproduct of only needing your own approval. So let me repeat that. You will get the approval of the people closest to you as a byproduct of only needing approval from yourself. So you set your own standards of success and work towards them. If you can train yourself to realize that other people's opinions don't matter and that failure really isn't that bad, you'll be just fine. So a funny thing about that basketball game, the second half was obviously miserable. I was rattled. I played horribly. I cried on the bus ride home from the game. I cried later that night at the kitchen table as my father and I talked over the game. Luckily, he worked hard to build me up. He focused on the positives. And the next night, I was super nervous to start the game, but a couple things went my way, and I ended up getting back in the flow, having the best game, one of the best games of my career. I think I scored more than 20 points. I had a steal in the last minute or so of the game, um, and I hit a layup you know, with a couple seconds left that kind of sealed the deal, and we won. The same fans who booed me the night before cheered me on and celebrated the win the very next night. So that just kind of tells you about how this balance is, is a little bit off here if you really think about what and worry about what people think of you. So now I have some even better news and more important things to say here. Getting uncomfortable and facing uncertainty is fun. It's very fun. What is the worst that could possibly happen if you take a leap and start a business? I'm serious. 
Think about it and answer this. If you're in America, you surely won't starve to death. Actually, if you're anywhere where you're able to listen to this podcast, you surely won't starve to death. You probably won't miss a meal. Your kids will be just fine. If you do it right and you do it in a low-risk way, you might lose a little bit of money. You might lose a little bit of time. It's not so bad, right? It's probably not even as bad as getting yelled at in front of all your peers and everybody that you love most by your high school basketball coach and by some fans that you barely even know their name, right? So it's the possible failure. It's that chance of failure that makes it so fun and makes the victory so sweet. Building something is fun. Entrepreneurship is so amazingly fun because you never know what's around that corner. You never know what could happen. When the phone rings, it could be an employee letting you know that he just rear-ended a Mercedes Benz on the highway. Or an employee calling you saying that he just ripped the top off of a company box truck on an overpass. I've gotten both of those calls before. It could also be the call from a college administrator letting you know that you just won the contract to be the preferred provider at a Big Ten university for storage. I've gotten that call as well. I've been there on my phone watching my email inbox go nuts with new customer signups beyond our wildest dreams. I've had a customer send me a personal thank you card after she packed her passport in her storage squad box and didn't realize it until she, it was 3 a.m. And, and she was about to catch her 7 a.m. flight to China. We answered that call at 3 a.m. It was during our, our tough days when Danny and I would drive around the box trucks during the day. We would do customers. We unload the where unload the trucks at the warehouse till midnight. We'd do customer service until 3 a.m. and then hopefully we'd sleep until about 5 a.m. when we needed to get the trucks ready to go again. It was during one of those nights. She called at 3 a.m. We answered the phone. We dug through the box. We found the passport. We delivered it to Boston Logan Airport, and it was just in time for her to get that passport get on her plane, and catch her flight to China. That was fun. So what drives you? That's the big question. What drives you? Is it the money? You might think it's the money and the things that you can buy with the money, but I'll tell you that it's not. The scientific data proves that money does not buy happiness beyond a certain point. How much money do you need? Really, how much money do you need in order to spend your time doing what you enjoy most and, and living the life you want to live? Get your number. Calculate it on, to, to, down to the dollar per week or per month and write it down. I bet it's a lot smaller than you think. My number is a lot smaller than I thought it would be. I'll tell you, most of the 40, 50-somethings grinding in corporate America for 60 hours a week have already greatly surpassed that dollar figure that they need to truly be happy, but they just keep working. Why, why do they do it? This, lead me, this leads me to the next one. Is it the status that drives you? Maybe, status drives a lot of people, but those people are rarely happy. There will always be someone else that has more than what you have. There will always be that next level of wealth. There will always be someone who has more than what you have. Someone who went on a more expensive vacation than you did and put photos on Facebook for you to scroll through. So if you chase status, you'll spend your life chasing something that's impossible to fully quantify. Is it time? Do you want to get your time back so you can spend it with the people who mean the most to you? Do you want to watch your kids grow up? Do you want to be at their Little League games? Do you want to go on daddy-daughter dates once a week with your amazing five-year-old? Most children don't get to ever experience timelessness with their parents, especially their dads. Will your children? So the first step is to find out what drives you. Build out your own sets of standards and your own goals, your own personal stamp of approval. You don't need anyone else's stamp of approval. So I'm going to send you off here with a challenge. Tomorrow morning, Wake up an hour earlier than normal. Make a cup of coffee, have a snack. Don't touch your phone, don't touch your computer, no input. Go to a quiet place in your house and think. And if you don't have a quiet place at your house, 
go to your car, go to a park, go somewhere. Get a pad and a pen and write. What do you want your day to look like in five years? What's your perfect day five years from now? In an ideal world, everything goes right. What's your day look like? What do you spend your time doing? Where are you? What are your hobbies? Who are you with? And now how much money do you need to make that happen? Don't let your anxiety and your insecurities hold you back. Don't let the fear of rejection hold you back. Don't let standards put on you by society keep you from making the decisions that align with your own personal goals. Get comfortable and embrace the uncomfort. Buck the nine to five. Embrace the possibility of failure. Go out and build the life you want. So as always, I'm here to help make this happen. Reach out if you have any questions at all. Nick at sweatystartup.com.